In 2015, a discovery was made in Mediterranean France that would shift our understanding of European prehistory in a whole new direction. The remains of a late Neanderthal were found at the entrance of a rock shelter called Crotte Mandrin, overhanging the Rhone River Valley. This Neanderthal, whose remains are still undergoing careful excavation, was male and his teeth suggest that he had reached adulthood. He was nicknamed Thorin, after J.R.R. Tolkien's character Thorin Oakenshield in his book The Hobbit, because both mark the end of a lineage. If only Tolkien knew that one day hominins would be named after his work. There's also this hominin species called Homo floresiensis, found on the Indonesian island of Flores, that's been nicknamed the Hobbit because they stood at only 3 feet 6 inches high on average. Before you know it, we'll probably have an archaic golem in Gandalf too. Anyways, what's special about Thorin is that researchers were able to extract and study his DNA, and what they found has serious implications for our understanding of both the Neanderthal extinction and the prehistoric past. I'm Adam Archaeologist, your go-to informant on everything archaeology, and in this episode, I'll dive into Thorin's late Neanderthal world and what his DNA has to say about late Neanderthal populations and their interactions with both other Neanderthal groups and early Eurasian Homo sapiens, and what was found will prompt a rethinking of prehistory. Was Thorin actually the last Neanderthal, as he's been called by the media? Not exactly. He wasn't the very last Neanderthal to exist, but his remains have been dated to near the extinction time, placed at roughly 40,000 years ago with the latest dating work. So we can say that he would have been one of the last. Thorin lived sometime between 42 to 52,000 years ago, but the researchers think that 42,000 years is more likely because some of his bones were recently found in the upper part of a stratigraphic layer, suggesting a younger age within this range. Even if his precise age isn't fully clear, he still lived closer to his species' extinction, and his DNA is giving us rare insights into one of the final Neanderthal lineages to exist in the Rhone Valley region. And what archaeologists have found in his DNA is taking our understanding of the Neanderthal extinction in a whole new direction. The Neanderthals are one of our close hominin relatives. The term hominin is used in anthropology to refer to the species that are part of the lineage that led to us modern humans and our close extinct relatives. It's different from hominid, which refers to the members of the hominidae taxonomic family, which today are gorillas, chimpanzees, bonobos, orangutans, and humans. Even though we're used to being the only hominin species around, there was a time when many different species of hominins were roaming the planet, and our ancestors even mated with some of them. One of these species was Homo neanderthalensis more commonly known as the Neanderthals. As a species, it has been estimated that we share more than 99% of our DNA with them. But there are important differences too, resulting from hundreds of thousands of years of evolutionary divergence between our species. Here's a classic Neanderthal compared to an anatomically modern human. Modern humans have a gracile postcranial skeleton, while the Neanderthals were more robust. We have reduced brow ridges, while Neanderthals have prominent double arched brow ridges. And we have longer limbs that, paired with more slender bodies, help dissipate heat in hot climates, whereas Neanderthals had shorter, stockier bodies with shorter limbs designed to help with heat retention. These are just a few of the observable differences between our species, there are also genes that code differently. Still, our DNA suggests that both of our species diverged from a common ancestor, and based on the anthropological record, it is thought by many that that ancestral species was Homo heidelbergensis, which probably evolved in Africa from Homo ergaster. But when talking about human evolution, Note that the anthropological record is patchy and there are still ongoing debates and many questions as to the evolutionary relationships between different species of Homo found in Africa, Europe, and Asia. The oldest securely dated fossils classified as Homo heidelbergensis date to about 600,000 years ago in both Europe and Africa. But the lithic industry that this species is associated with, called the Acheulean, appears in Africa earlier than in Europe. The oldest known Acheulean stone tools date to 1.76 million years ago and were found in Kenya. And the traditional view is that Acheulean tools were introduced to Europe about 600,000 years ago with the first appearance of Homo heidelbergensis fossils there. These suggest that Homo heidelbergensis originated in Africa and then some Homo heidelbergensis populations migrated to Europe. It is interesting, though, that some approximately 800,000-year-old fossils found at Grandolina in Spain might be an early form of Homo heidelbergensis, but they could also be another species that's been called Homo antecessor. More recent research also suggests that the Acheulean industry might have been present in Spain close to a million years ago. These findings show just how complicated the study of human evolution really is and how much more research is needed, but for now, the prevailing view is that Homo heidelbergensis originated in Africa and that some populations of the species moved out of Africa while others stayed on the continent. 
The ones that stayed in Africa evolved into Homo sapiens, and those that migrated to Europe evolved into the Neanderthals. To summarize this all quickly, Homo sapiens and the Neanderthals diverged from a common ancestor, and that ancestor was likely Homo heidelbergensis, of which the European branch evolved into Neanderthals and the African branch into anatomically modern humans. After painting on cave walls, perforating shells to wear as ornaments, and even leaving behind a fingerprint, the Neanderthals went extinct about 40,000 years ago, according to our current dating work. But part of their gene pool still lives on in the DNA of billions of people today. It was long thought that everyone except Sub-Saharan Africans carry some Neanderthal DNA. However, more recent research suggests that Sub-Saharan Africans today do carry a tiny bit of Neanderthal DNA too, which they acquired from Eurasians migrating into Africa. Still, the amount is higher in populations outside of Sub-Saharan Africa. On average, non-Africans have about 1-4% Neanderthal DNA if we go by the draft Neanderthal sequence paper, although other estimates have been proposed too, like 1.5-2.1% in this study. But the important thing to know is that the percentage varies both from population to population, with East Asians carrying more Neanderthal DNA than West Eurasians on average, and from person to person due to the nature of inheritance. The Neanderthal ancestry carried by non-Africans today comes from a single admixture event. Recent paleogenomic research on individuals from present-day Germany and one individual from the present-day Czech Republic, who lived more than 40,000 years ago, they are the oldest modern human genome sequence to date, found that the Neanderthal DNA that these ancient Europeans harbored also came from that same admixture event, which perhaps took place over several generations. And so the researchers were able to constrain the timing of the admixture event to roughly 45 to 49,000 years ago. We don't know exactly where this took place, but somewhere in West Asia is most likely due to the fact that that Neanderthal DNA is carried all over Eurasia and beyond. Why did the Neanderthals go extinct? The answer to this question is far from straightforward and it has been long debated by academics. Various hypotheses have been proposed, but there are two main competing ones. One that favors Homo sapiens driving them out through competition, and another that favors climate change. The competition with anatomically modern humans hypothesis proposes that Homo sapiens outcompeted the Neanderthals for resources after they arrived in Neanderthal territory, eventually replacing the Neanderthals entirely because they had certain advantages over Neanderthal populations, like better tools and more cognitive abilities. The climate change hypothesis sees that drastic fluctuations in the climate disrupted Neanderthal habitats and food sources, and thus the Neanderthals, unable to adapt to these conditions, were driven to extinction. Either way, this is a hotly debated topic amongst anthropologists and even archaeologists, and it is probably more complex than can be described by a single variable. But it looks like the debate is being taken in an interesting new direction with Thorin's genome. What did the researchers find in Thorin's DNA? They found that Thorin came from a previously unknown Neanderthal lineage that diverged around 100 to 105,000 years ago from the ancestral European Neanderthal lineage and likely remained genetically isolated for at least 50,000 years. Divergence refers to the accumulation of genetic differences between two or more populations. When enough changes have accumulated, we say that populations have diverged or split. They've become their own populations. Genetic isolation, meanwhile, means that a population did not exchange genes with other populations of the same species. Thorin's DNA was similar to the Gibraltar Neanderthals, and in the same study, the researchers actually found it more likely that the Gibraltar lineage itself diverged from Thorin's lineage rather than independently from the ancestral lineage. They placed this divergence at about 81,000 years ago. The researchers analyzed another French Neanderthal's DNA as well, who lived approximately 43,000 years ago, and identified a previously unknown ghost lineage that had contributed its DNA to this other Neanderthal, called Le Cote. All in all, they found that there were actually at least two or three distinct Neanderthal lineages in Europe during the late Neanderthal period, which is a major finding and makes one wonder how many other distinct late Neanderthal genetic lineages are waiting to be discovered. Thorin's DNA further showed signs of recent inbreeding and suggested that he was part of a small-sized population. He also did not share more alleles with modern humans when compared to other West Eurasian Neanderthals, which tells us two things. One, that there was no recent interbreeding between the Neanderthals at the Grotte Mandran and Homo sapiens, and two, that the Neanderthal populations that did mate with anatomically modern humans diverged before Thorin's lineage. In summary, Thorin was inbred, came from a population with a small group size, and his genetic lineage remained genetically isolated from other Neanderthal lineages for tens of thousands of years. The members of his lineage chose to also not exchange genes with anatomically modern humans. Given that Thorin lived close to the Neanderthal extinction, these findings have important implications for the nature of this event or process. Could specific choices the Neanderthals had made been responsible, in part, for their species' extinction? 
It hit me while I was first reading about Thorin just how much Neanderthals have been treated as passive beings, at least when it comes to discussing their extinction. The two main competing hypotheses, climate change and competition with anatomically modern humans, make the climate and Homo sapiens the main drivers in this story, and Neanderthals just the passive recipients of the stuff that was going on around them. Rather than merely being passive victims of climatic shifts or dying out because of Homo sapiens, maybe some groups of Neanderthals made certain choices, like inbreeding and genetically isolating themselves from neighboring groups, that contributed to their decline and ultimate extinction. Maybe they were more active players in their own extinction story than we originally thought. Why was Thorne's group practicing inbreeding and why did members of his population isolate themselves for tens of thousands of years? Was this a deliberate decision that was part of wider Neanderthal social organization? Thorin's group wasn't isolated geographically. According to the study's lead researcher, Ludovic Slimak, they were a 10-day walk from another Neanderthal group, and so they easily could have exchanged genes. It seems, then, that they chose not to. The reason why isn't clear. Was it language-related? Were there cultural clashes? Or was it pure disinterest in what was going on in the world around them? Thorin also isn't the only Neanderthal to show evidence of inbreeding. The so-called Altai Neanderthal from Siberia is another example. Her DNA showed that her parents were closely related, possibly as half-siblings, and that mating between close relatives had taken place among her recent ancestors as well. Signs of inbreeding are also seen in the skeletal remains of Neanderthals from a site in Spain dated to roughly 49,000 years ago. Thorin's inbred ancestry, then, isn't a unique phenomenon among the Neanderthals, but seeing that he was inbred and came from a lineage that was genetically isolated for an extremely long period of time, adds an extra layer of depth to our understanding of Neanderthal behavior and social organization. Based on these studies, it seems like inbreeding was a more widespread phenomenon among Neanderthal populations, both geographically and temporally. But we need more Neanderthal genomes to find out exactly how widespread it was. For example, the high-coverage genome of a Neanderthal from Vindia Cave in Croatia did not show the extreme inbreeding seen in the Altai Neanderthal. But if it does turn out that inbreeding was, in general, more commonly practiced than not, and this suggests that the Neanderthals were making some decisions that, in hindsight, are terrible for the success and survival of a population. Sure, they had small population sizes, but so did Eurasian Homo sapiens back then. It seems then that there was a major difference with regards to our social organization. Those early groups of Homo sapiens in Eurasia are thought to have been small in size, but they moved around and exchanged genes with their neighbors, a lot. And this ultimately helped their species' success. We are the last hominin species around, our ancestors had to have been doing something, right? Meanwhile, at least some Neanderthals seem to have preferred keeping to themselves, and by that I don't mean just to their own species, but to their little groups and even families. They don't seem to have liked exchanging genes with their neighbors as much as our ancestors did. And in the end, only those Neanderthals who did make the choice of exchanging genes with anatomically modern humans are the ones who have left behind a living genetic legacy. Some Neanderthals in Siberia also exchanged genes with Denisovans, but they seem to have been exceptions among the Neanderthals. It's very likely that more than one factor led to the Neanderthal extinction. We need to consider all the different variables at play and not try to pinpoint one specific cause. Different factors may have also played out in different regions. But I think it's time we seriously considered the possibility that Neanderthals were influencing their own fate. That they weren't just the passive recipients of what was happening around them. I'm not saying that external events didn't have any influence, like I said, there were probably various variables involved. But Thorin's DNA does prompt us to rethink what these variables could have been. The deliberate choices that the Neanderthals were making is certainly one factor that needs to be taken more seriously. The genetic isolation of his lineage is a game-changing finding because how does a population remain genetically isolated for tens of thousands of years despite there being other Neanderthal groups nearby? As Ludovic Slimak said, all processes need to be rethought. And Thorin's DNA isn't just taking the debate on the Neanderthal extinction in a new direction, it's also rewriting prehistory because it not only suggests that there were different lineages of Neanderthals present in Europe at the time of their extinction, but it also adds another layer of insight into our understanding of social interactions in the past. Thorin didn't show any evidence of recent interbreeding with Homo sapiens, even though there's evidence of Homo sapiens having been in Europe at the same time and they even temporarily occupied Côte Mandrin 54,000 years ago. It's also noteworthy that we haven't found any evidence of Homo sapiens DNA in any of the late Neanderthals whose genomes we have sequenced to date. To quote the study, Socially speaking, the absence of recent Homo sapiens introgression within late Neanderthal populations could have been part of a larger pattern affecting the latter, which seemed to have limited or avoided gene exchange not only with early Homo sapiens but, more generally, within Neanderthal populations themselves. 
Anthropologically, these gene exchange processes are never limited to a love affair between two individuals, but systematically correspond to the alliances that human populations consciously decide to build. The absence of gene exchanges, or the non-reciprocity, presence of Neanderthal genes in the first Homo sapiens in Europe, with no reciprocity in the last Neanderthals, raises questions about the social structures that govern these Neanderthal populations. Our results thus suggest that small isolated populations with, and potentially without, limited intergroup exchanges may well represent a surprising and more general feature of Neanderthal social structures. End quote. With the new information we've gained from Thorne's DNA, we'll have to reconsider not only interactions between Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans through time and space, but also how Neanderthals were interacting with members of their own species. Homo sapiens and Neanderthals had very different ways of being in the world, and even among Neanderthals, it seems that their behavior was much more complex than we originally thought. Some Neanderthals had children with our species, some with Denisovans, and others didn't exchange a single gene outside of their own group for tens of thousands of years. With every new genome sequenced, we are gaining new insights into the past, but also new questions. How widespread was Thorin's lineage? How many more isolated Neanderthal lineages are waiting to be discovered? If more Neanderthal genomes show the same patterns of genetic isolation and that inbreeding was a widespread phenomenon, then this will certainly point towards deliberate choices the Neanderthals were making that ultimately helped lead to their extinction. Homo sapiens, on the other hand, are known for the exact opposite. Our ancient ancestors moved around and exchanged genes with each other, a lot, and this has certainly played a role in our success as a species. We are the last hominin species to roam the planet, and it's not just because we are better adapted as a species, but also because our ancestors made choices that were better in the long run. Maybe curiosity didn't kill the cat. That's it for this episode. Subscribe for more cool content by your go-to informant on everything archaeology, Madam Archaeologist.